In this episode, we talk about electric bacteria, driverless cars, and the Alien Orgus competition. Hello, sci-fi fans. You're listening to the Sci-Fi Ideas podcast with me, Mark Ball, and joining me, as usual, is my brother, friend, and colleague, David Ball. Oh, hello. Oh, brother, friend, and <laughs> colleague. Right, I thought great. I'd try something different since I normally... Uh, too much. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> the great David Ball. Hi, thank you, thank you. Right, what are we talking about? Today we are talking about Alien August, the special event on the Sci-Fi Ideas website. Okay, good. Which, uh, depending on how long it takes me to edit this, may have already begun. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, tell us what Alien August is. It's a month-long event specialising in uh, well, in aliens. Basically, it's an excuse for us to post lots of articles about aliens. Mm-hmm. Lots of uh, alien profile articles and such like. Um, there's also a competition yep. where we're encouraging the viewers, listeners, readers, whatever, to, uh, to write their own alien profiles and send them in. And we'll share all the entries on the website. Okay. And there's a prize. Ah, what is the mm. prize? The prize is actually a prize bundle. Uh, okay. There is a, a competition winner's mug. Ooh. Ooh. Yes, the much-coveted competition winner's mug. And there are some books as well, um, including Time Commander by William Benning. Okay. And the Ganthoran Gambit by William Benning. He's, uh, okay. he's, he's donated these books for us. So I've got to That's give him a book. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah. Good on that man. Thank you to him, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also my really geeky sci-fi quiz book. Oh, which yes, talked good. about before, yes. Yeah, um, excellent. And what else is there? Uh, I've got a... Oh, oh there, thought... there's... Um, yeah, I, I was meant to have these all out in front of me, but... Uh, oh, you had. <laughs> <laughs> there is an alien sketchbook by Mark, uh, Mike Carrero. Ooh, okay. Which... Uh, isn't quite as good as it sounds. He's a brilliant artist. Um, <laughs> what do you mean he's not as good as it sounds? Sketchbook. I was sounds a little brilliant. bit disappointed by this sketchbook. It, oh. Because it's it's only black and white sketches. Um, which is disappointing once you've seen his, his really cool digital art. But uh, never mind. <laughs> this doesn't sound like the best plug you could be It doesn't, with. does it? <laughs> so, hang on. What are you saying is that he's a very, very good artist, but he's not uh, put the best stuff in the book. That's right. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. Is yeah. it like? Is it maybe an old book, and he's he's back, he's going to do a, a new one or something? Well, I think it's because obviously printing in colour is very expensive. Oh, um, I see. Yeah, and this is just a little something he's produced to um, well to get some some support really, so that his fans can support him a bit by buying the book. Oh, right. Okay. Um, which is, is why I bought it. Uh, that sounds like a good idea. Mm. Why don't you buy the really geeky sci-fi quiz book? <laughs> yes, and support me and support sci-fi ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um so there, is there's it... also another another book in there called okay. Alien Worlds by um it's on my shelf and I can't reach without taking my headphones off, which is um it's it's about it's a kid's book introducing kids to the idea of speculative biology and planetology, which is a brilliant idea. Oh uh who's that by? You did an article about that, didn't you? I did, I did, um, and I can't see it without taking my headphones off <laughs> to see the author's name. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, it's Alien Worlds, Your Guide to Extraterrestrial Life by David A. Aguilar. Ah, okay, right, very good. So, um, is it too late if people want to send us more things for the prize bundle? Uh, not at all, no, if, if you want to send us uh, a book and uh, have, have us plug it for you. Well, it depends. Exchange, yeah. It depends when people are listening to this, though, doesn't it? What's the What's the cut off date for that? Um, ooh, I don't know. Well, well basically, suppose... at, at this point, the easiest thing to do is to send um, free ebook vouchers. Yeah. Okay. If, if you can. So, um, as long as it's before the end of August two thousand fourteen. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Because the sooner you send it, the sooner we can plug it. Yeah. And get more, get more plugging out of it. So, have you got an example of the type of alien that w- you're looking for? 
Um, well, there are a few examples on the Sci-Fi Ideas website already. Um, all the alien profiles that we've got. We've got quite um, a lot from last year, haven't we? We have, yes. From the competition and, and ones that we've done ourselves. Yeah. Wh- which ones shall we pick out? Well, the, there was one that you said that you talked about earlier. Um, you were going to mention. Oh, uh, a new one that I've yeah. created for this year's event. Which uh, Yeah, tell us about that. I'll, I'll make sure it's published by the time this goes out then, so I can put a link in the show notes. Um, yep. They are called the Chiricnic, and they are a species of flightless bird. Okay. Are they uh, sentient? They are sentient, yes. They they have an advanced society. Um, okay. I haven't said how advanced, I've just said um, comparable to Earth. So it depends kind of if it's in the future or what. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Um. The interesting thing about the Chirichnik is how... Um, well, okay, I said to you earlier, I really like it when aliens have one unique trait, one thing that really sets them apart yeah. from the crowd, and, and and that that then affects the way their society has developed. Yeah, okay. And I think that this is really good world-building practice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so the Chirichnik, um, I was thinking about how they don't have hands because they're birds. In fact, they're not having any wings either. They're more okay. like, they're like, a, like an emu. Um, Emus got tiny little wings, I think. Emus apparently have no. Oh no, I think that they have maybe have uh, vestigial wings, little stumps. Oh, I get a bit confused between an emu, an ostrich, and a rhea. I get confused between them. What's a rhea? Uh, they've got some in a farm near near us. They just look like, well, it's a big bird. Oh. One escaped. It's on the news. Um, <laughs> I, there's a cassowary. They don't have any wings. I'm pretty sure emus don't either. They might have little vestigial bone wings, just little stumps. I don't know. Right. Okay, anyway, never mind. Well, actually, uh, when I was developing this idea, I was um, at the <coughs> Kendall Museum. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, looking at stuffed animals, which uh, is always <laughs> a good way of getting inspiration. <laughs> I think it is, actually. Uh, I think looking at um, existing creatures, if you go to somewhere like a zoo... You know, or um, I think aquariums are the best because I think sea creatures really? have got the, the, got such a huge variety of, um, yeah, you know, different types of species that all do really different things. I mean, if you mm. if you go to a zoo and you see mammals, they'll all sort of be the same, won't they? But yeah. if you look, but if you look at fish or crabs or the things that live under the sea, are so different. And I think you can get oh, some really yeah. good, uh, like, creative ideas for aliens. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, worked for James Cameron, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. James Cameron, explorer of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, in, in the basement of this museum, there was um, an art exhibition exploring yeah. um, stuffed animals, uh, taxidermy, some kind of half-stuffed animals, and uh, all the birds. They didn't have any wings. It was basically showing before the wings had been put on, and they just had wire coming out, wire that you would obviously attach the wing to. Oh, right. And had this idea of maybe if if birds had these little vestigial wing stumps, they could then manufacture artificial limbs to put on those stumps, artificial arms. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, like, um, but uh, that's actually not the route I went with this. I just okay. thought I'd share that because that's another interesting idea. So it's, it's just like a instead... prosthetic arm for a for a bird, isn't it? Hmm. Okay. But I decided not to have those prosthetic arms. I thought, what if they haven't got any stumps at all? And I came up with the idea that, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I was thinking about puppeteers, Larry Niven's puppeteers. Oh, yeah. How their heads are kind of like uh, two birds' heads, and they, they act as hands. Yeah. Um, so I came up with this idea of, of a mated pair of birds doing everything together. So they just use their beaks. Obviously, just with one hand, there's, there's or one beak, there's little you can do. <laughs> but if a mated pair spend all their time together and work as a unit... So that they even right. kind of start to think the same. Hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. So they're, they're physically joined together? Not physically joined together, no. Okay. They are just a mated pair who, uh, you know, get to know each other and are very good at uh, working together. Oh, right, okay. So, what, one would pick stuff up and the other and one would... the other would, yeah, do... manipulate it in some way, yeah. So, so if they wanted to eat some food, one would pick it up and the other one would eat it, then they'd just... Swap round. Yeah, yeah. And, and imagine if you wanted to tie a knot, you can't do that with just one beak, can you? 
So they would no. have to work. That would be a very complex task working together, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, which obviously you probably could coordinate with a stranger, but a mated pair who know each other very well could probably. This would that. have to. This is extreme uh, uh, team. Extreme team teamwork, isn't it? Yeah. Teamwork, yeah. Mm, so this is where okay. it comes to the you birds. A lot of birds mate for life. Um. So then, uh, that's kind of their their unique. That's their USP. So I started yeah, okay. thinking, how would this affect their society? And I thought about well, what about unmated birds, birds that can't get a mate, singletons. They would be really um, what kind of left out. And I, I've talked about how they then can't get jobs. Well, uh, I'm assuming that they would get jobs as a as a unit. To you know, if you're employing someone, you have to employ two. You have to employ yeah. a couple. So only only mated pairs are employable, really. Although things oh, have now started right. to change, and there is a single rights movement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so and then this is, is also uh, seeped into their culture, their religion as well, where they have a dualist religion worshipping the sun and moon equally. Okay. And it's said that the sun and moon are both parents of the planet. The planet is seen as an egg that they are nurturing, taking it in turns to nurture the nest. Okay. The eggs. Um, and there's a prophecy that one day the, the planet will will hatch. <laughs> Unleashing some some great and powerful god. So that's so that's building on the 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 theme that they're birds. Um, yes, and, and and on this working as a pair thing. But they but if the uh, if their planet is just uh, one egg, it doesn't really work with ev- you know them that everything is in pairs. And yeah, I suppose that's one thing that's not paired. Yeah, unless maybe there's another planet nearby that it would pair with, or maybe there's twins. Maybe the planet. Is an egg for twins? I don't, I, there's I'm all just, kinds I'm of things. Yeah, just there's thinking all kinds out of things loud. Really, you could have it as a binary star system, and there's a lot of ways to play around with that idea, isn't there? Okay, so what kind of stories could come from this idea? Obviously, you've got about the the single rights movement, which I think is really good. Mm. You could have stories set in that. You could have a protagonist who's a single a singleton trying to find a mate just so that they can get a job. In yeah. fact, that that would that would be a quite interesting short story because. You know, you can you've got enough time to explore the the world, um, and then, well, you don't really have to take it any further because you know talking about the world is is enough for a short story, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's interesting. So I've actually been playing around with a bit of a story idea of um, a kind of a love triangle situation, okay. where the only time these mated pairs will be separate is when they've got eggs that need to be looked after. So they will take it in turns to look after the nest, and the other will will go to work. Yeah, That's but that means that idea. one of them's useless. If say say that they're working in the construction industry, they're building houses. Yes. The one of them has to stay behind and look after the egg, and the other one has to go to. But the, he can't. He or yeah. she, the the other one, well, can't so, lift anything. So the idea is he gets paired with a young single bird, who he then falls in love with. <gasps> Oh my god! Mm, shocking. Hey, that's <laughs> hey. No, that's interesting. Actually, that that they might have these um, singletons around that they could just pair with temporarily. Yeah, yeah. Sort of like um. W- would they become kind of like would they stand-ins? Be used? Yeah. Well, like slaves. Well, I, I think the singletons would be kind of uh, oppressed. I think they'd be taken advantage of slightly in this society. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Yeah, my thinking was that this is quite a young, beautiful female bird who uh, she's just coming up to the age of of mating, of, of wanting to be paired with somebody. Yeah. Um, but instead of being paired with somebody of her own age, she's decided that she's falling in love with this older bird and that she wants to be with him, but she can't because he's already mated. Um, it's yeah, quite a standard, standard love story, really. Standard love story on a very bizarre world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about another idea? Again, going with the sort of romance theme, which I, I don't know if you really want to go with that. I mean, it's a science sci-fi story, but why not? Well, what what if you've got a mated pair are acting as one? If they are one unit, could they then be attracted to another mated pair? Oh, that's an interesting idea, yeah. Oh. Well, I was thinking about exploring... That is a bit weird, uh, isn't it? Maybe exploring the whole kind of threesome idea. Oh, God. 
Are we going to have to change the rating when, of this podcast? When did this... <laughs> 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 but this it's getting a bit makes rude. perfect sense though, right? Because when this guy comes home and it's his turn to look after the nest, then his wife has to go to work, and who's she going to be paired with? Maybe the, okay. with the same bird, and maybe, uh, well, we don't have to have her falling in love with this other bird, but she could then, you know, become friends and they accept this this younger bird into their family. Would that would that have repercussions? Would that be really frowned upon in bird society? You're saying bird quite a lot, and it's disturbing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, what this reminds me of is, you know, Daniel Benson has a, um, in his stories, he's got, um, I can't remember what the alien species is called, but they've got a similar thing where there's two, like a male and a female, get together and they, they join to become one entity. I'm pretty sure they right. do. Uh, it's been a while since I've, since I've read his. Hmm. Um, but yeah, he, he has something similar. Okay, so let's go back to Aileen August. I want to mm-hmm. just ask some questions that people are probably gonna gonna ask. Yeah. Um, what kind of thing are we looking for for the to be the perfect alien? You know, what's going to win? Well, the most creative idea, yeah, is uh, <laughs> what I've been saying. Of course, there is a little bit more to it than that because it has to be well written, and of course, it has to. Uh, to make sense is, is quite yeah, important. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, can, you can't just have just completely crazy ideas that are just gibberish. Really? Um, Why not? And well, how well, much sense? How much sense does it have to make? Because science fiction can be a little crazy sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll come up with fairly outlandish things that don't exist just to sort of make make things happen. Yeah. And again, I think we're coming back to this very common debate that we have on this podcast about uh, the difference between science fiction and fantasy. Um, yeah. Should things make scientific sense and be explained all the time, or should they be purely creative um, and possibly even magical? There's kind of, um, there's a balance to be found, isn't there, between creativity yeah. and logic? Can we, for example, have, um, I'm just thinking that there's one of the articles that were posted recently, um, an alien called Osteonimbus, I think it was called. So that that's like a, a floating a floating creature that eats I think it like digests gas or something and it has algae inside it that produces yeah. things that, make, that makes it float. Now I think that's a really cool idea, these little aliens floating yeah. about. But if if a scientist looked at that, he'd probably go, mm, that doesn't make any sense. But I like <laughs> I like the idea. I don't I don't like yeah. it when science, you know, actual science gets in the way of a cool idea. I think that as as long as there's some sort of pseudo explanation, you can probably get away a with a pseudo lot. explanation. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to. Science doesn't it probably shouldn't get in the way. But it is really nice when you can use a little bit of science to justify it and okay. make it seem more plausible. So that that's that's. What we're saying for Alien August, then it, yeah. it has to have when, some sort of explanation, but doesn't you matter. You don't really have to focus on the science, though. I mean, you can focus on creating a really interesting society. Okay. Well, I mean, that was going to be my next the, question. With the birds, then. with the Chiricnic, I haven't really mentioned science at all. All I've done is said they're birds, and here's their society. So that that that's the other thing. Then, how much of these aliens? Um, how much do we want people to focus on the actual physical side? of the alien, you know, describe the actual alien, and, and how much do we want it about the, the world building of where, they, where they're where they from and the society? That should be bit... entirely up to you. It depends yeah. what is more interesting about the aliens, which you want to focus on. Yeah, I think okay. the, the, best, the best article probably will mention the biology and the society and yeah. as many different things as possible, but if the biology is not as interesting as the society, then don't focus on it. Focus on whichever is the most interesting aspect. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, another question then is, do these aliens have to be intelligent or could they be, you know, a, a creature or a beast? You know, something that's just a... Just yeah, something a, an animal. Hunt for food or, I don't know, it's yeah. just, yeah, just a monster. Can it, can it be a monster? Could, it, could, it could be a monster. It could be an animal, absolutely. The the only uh, problem with that is you're limiting yourself slightly by you then won't be able to talk about their society 
as much. I mean, obviously, animals do have yeah. a form of society. Um, but if you think you've got a really interesting biology yeah. for an animal, then, yeah, great, go for it. Yeah, okay. Well, you can talk a lot about animals. You know, there's there's nature programs that talk that can go yeah, on for animal behavior hours and hours talking about animals. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, right. I, I just wanted to ask that that question really mm-hmm. to uh, yeah. to make it clear. That was all. Yeah. And so this competition is running throughout August. It closes on August the thirtieth, and I'll hopefully announce the winner on August thirty first. Is the plan? Two thousand fourteen. Two thousand fourteen. Yes. <laughs> uh, what's the word limit? The word limit is 1,000 words Okay So that's just enough Yeah, okay Yeah. You can cover uh, yeah, quite a bit in that. You, you can cover a lot in that, can't yeah. you? But it, yeah. just can't, it doesn't allow it to get too long Yeah, it stops people kind of waffling on too much And, and showing yeah. you know, too much uh, technical detail Okay, good so there's, there's another interesting example from, um, I think I posted this during last year's Alien August, is um, the Woosians. And I've often, uh, talking to you, I've, I've often pulled up on this as a quite a good example of, of that single interesting trait. Yeah, okay. And the Woosians are, are a frog-like species. You can see a bit of a theme developing here with my work, can't you? <laughs> well, it's all like based on animals. Animals, yeah. But the, I think that's fine. Yeah, why not? It makes them easy to uh, describe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're amphibians. Um, they have a society based on uh, greed, like the Ferengi. The interesting thing about these is they uh, they actually produce a virus. They naturally right. produce a virus from glands okay. as a defense mechanism. Hence the name Woosians. It makes people feel woozy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's quite that's um, quite interesting. Yeah. So this virus is, is actually quite contagious. Um, this gives them problems when they're meeting other alien species. So they, they have oh. to partly remain isolated. Um, okay, so they, they're doing this um, not deliberately. It's like a passive thing. So even if they're meeting thing. someone that they want to be friends with, uh, they might give them a virus. They might do, yes. But they've actually capitalised on this. And their biggest industry now is selling the antidote to <laughs> alien species. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Imagine if this was a Star Trek story, and uh, and you know the Woosians are just a race that wants to join the Federation or something like mm. that. Everyone else, everyone that works with these Woosians, would have to have this virus. Uh, sorry, the, the antivirus. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't they? Yeah. And so I even think there's if a lot the Woosians of story are, are are good guys. Then they're still gonna they're gonna benefit, aren't they, from from the whole industry set yeah. up to, to produce the the antibodies. That's quite a good one. Shall I read uh, one of our story starting points? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Right. This is one that uh, I posted that I wrote a little while ago, and it's called "The Car Hackers of the Driverless Revolution." Ah. That one, yeah. Yeah. Shall I read it? Yeah. The safest way to travel was how they sold the driverless revolution at first, and we loved it. Car accidents are a thing of the past. It was true. Computers were much faster at making those important decisions about road safety. Cars automatically slammed their own brakes on if a pedestrian ran into the road. Something, though, that arrogant teenagers started to abuse once they'd realised they'd be safe every time, sometimes causing traffic chaos. But like all software, it can be overridden. Computers are fast decision makers, but are only following instructions. We called them cackers, car hackers, people who altered the inbuilt behaviours of their own vehicles. The manufacturers didn't like it, of course, and neither did the transport agency. Cackers hacked their cars to break the automated speed limit, and a new subculture of boy racers was born, something that we thought we'd never see again after the driverless revolution. Then came the ethical cackers, who'd hack your car for benefits like better fuel economy, a smoother ride, or a marginally shorter route, as long as you didn't mind taking slightly sharper corners at speed. As this became more popular, car manufacturers started to build it in, allowing a user to select their own driving style preference. And for the first time since the driverless revolution, people had individual control again. Well, not absolute control, of course, but were asked what the car should do in certain situations. These options were presented to the vehicle's user, 
the term driver, of course, was a thing of the past, as a multiple choice of scenarios. Most importantly was Directive 112, which became infamous in the media as what divided people the most. What to do about arrogant teenagers walking out in front of the car? Should the car break, potentially causing travel chaos, or not? Okay, so mm. that is just a, a short idea I had when uh, I was reading an article about, um, you know, driverless cars that we may or may not get in the in the near future. And um, I suppose there's, what, there's quite a few um, issues raised there, issues that uh, probably haven't been thought about by by Google and their driverless well, cars. I don't know. I, I don't know if they if they have thought about this, but I was just thinking really because I saw this article and it said, "Okay, a car. Everyone's got you know. Imagine everyone's got all these automated cars. Hmm. An accident might might happen. So something random like a, a deer runs into the road. Yeah. A car would have would have to swerve. It, it hasn't got. It can't just put its brakes on. Um, it it has to swerve. What if it swerves? It, what if the software for the car it has to choose between swerving into a larger car or a smaller car. Does the software choose to protect the driver inside the car uh, over over the ones outside? You know, if it has to swerve, and say there's a situation where it has to swerve and hit a yeah um, uh, a cyclist, yeah, w- w- who does it think about preserving first the the cyclist or the the car the person full of inside? kids? <laughs> and car full of kids. Yeah, does it does it know that oh, a car on its good. left it has kids in it, and a car on its right has old people in it? Does it's it have to make it? It's a Yoshi Maru situation. It's, it's does it have blues, to make it, it decision? To... Yeah. And also, if it does crash into someone, who's responsible for that? Is it the the user of the car who's you know not doing anything? He's just sat there, or is mm. it the the people who made the car? Because right now, right now, if you crash your car into someone it's your responsibility because you're yeah. the one controlling it even if even if maybe the, it was sort of the car's you know the car was maybe well i guess if this fault. is a deer in the road then you could say that that's an act of god oh god oh, I mean, really you could, you could try and sue the deer i suppose <laughs> 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 but you, you could try and sue the um whoever's responsible for the deer the uh you know are, are you driving through a national park for example i think that that's i i, I don't think we should focus on who's who should be sued <laughs> oh, i suppose i suppose that is part of it though because people always want to assign blame don't they yes yeah. and do do you blame the company or do you uh, you know the company might then go ah oh, that was the fault of this one programmer who made a yeah. who made a programming error you know he might have they're, programmed they're selling th- faulty software perhaps um yeah because that's the sort of thing that would make you choose one company over another if if yeah yeah you know say a cheaper manufacturer has got worse software the ethical decision of, of who to hit is a very tricky one i mean that's yeah. something not covered by asimov's laws isn't it <laughs> yeah i i don't know you hit the um, car with a fewer number of people in but then you've also got this thing about choice uh, we're assuming that all automated cars have the same software and that, that the user doesn't do anything the user just sitting in the back you know might mm. be asleep but yeah. if the user has the choice over certain things, which I I added a bit in that that story yeah. style, like the the choice of do they do they want the driving style to be uh, more economical, but you know be able to make corners faster, yeah, less braking, or something like that, yeah, 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 that's it, yeah, less braking because everyone's got a different driving style, haven't they? You've got someone who who drives very efficiently, mm. uh, but might make it like coast quite a lot, or you've got yeah. someone who drives aggressively and brakes sharply mm. uh should the automated car reflect that you know has the user got the right well, to make I, the decision i assume that there'll, there'll be laws in place to uh to govern this that they'll you know in the, in the future bureaucracy there'll, there'll be standards to be met of um well i don't talk about emissions because we, we might have uh all kinds of fancy electric cars um yeah. But yeah, they will have to be efficient and the software will surely make sure it's driven in an efficient manner. Do people want their cars to be efficient? You get some people who like to rev their engine quite a lot. They like it to make uh, a make a noise. To, to show off, yeah. They or... like they like to drive and fast and brake right hard. In the idea and suggesting that some will will hack it to go faster. Well, yeah. Yeah. 
if there's a speed limit that you can't get over, and some people think, ah, oh, let's just let's just uh, up that a bit. Yeah, I'm just got to tweak the program a little bit. Yeah. But then, if they've made some changes to their car, they are responsible for it. If they it, are, then responsible if, if it's an injures... accident. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And also, the other thing that um, I think is quite interesting is with these automated cars, people might just walk out in front of them. Hmm. And um, either to be a nuisance, kind of doing it for kicks, which I can imagine kids doing, playing chicken, or yeah. just pedestrians thinking, oh, whatever, they'll stop, and I want to get across the road, yeah. And I've seen people like that. Yeah. Uh, I've seen people do that all the time. They they just casually crossing the road going, oh, yeah, you'll stop, you'll stop. Yeah. Um, because they know that if someone runs them over, they'll... <laughs> be sued. Yeah. <laughs> um, I get people yeah. when I'm when I'm driving my van all the time walking behind me when I'm reversing, and I don't oh, even right, okay. see them until they've gone past, and they don't know I could have hit the accelerator and gone straight back into them. But is that just because they didn't didn't really think about it, or are they just being deliberately arrogant? I think a, a bit of both. <laughs> being <laughs> impatient anyway. is what they're being, <laughs> but. Either way, it might happen, so the software has to have rules for that, mm. you know. But well, the software is likely to be overly it? cautious, isn't it? I would have thought so. Yeah. And Which so means, what if someone... Hack around that. Uh, what if someone wants to rob you? What if someone wants to hijack the car? Ooh, you just have to get someone to stand it, yeah. stand in front. So just somebody will, just goes... Totally stop. Yeah, or even if you just approach it at the lights and you're within a certain distance of the vehicle, it might stay still for safety reasons then. Yeah, which means that someone could just smash your windows and rob yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, um, some in- interesting questions raised there. Um, well, I thought it could be expanded into a into a bigger story anyway. The way that I think a story might work is that maybe from the point of view of a, uh, a programmer who works for a company uh, you know, making software for these cars... Well, I think a better story would be about uh, a gang of cackers. Okay. Um, what? M- maybe a, a small company that, that hacks people's cars for them. Okay. A small, a and, small garage. So maybe legitimately or... Oh, that, that would imagine that would be a criminal activity. I suppose so, yeah. But I suppose, yeah, that con- kind of story could just raise the debates, couldn't it? Yeah, which is what all good sci-fi does. Yeah, true. Have you heard about the electric bacteria that's been discovered? No. Ele- electric, uh, ba- electric bacteria it- that eats electrons. Hang on, the bacteria it the bacteria itself can't be electric. Um, well, this is how it's being described, but it, it eats and excretes electrons. I don't even know how that makes sense. <laughs> this, is, this is absolutely legitimate uh, new discovery. In fact... There are a few different types of species have been discovered that do this, and it kind of mm-hmm. redefines um, what life is sli- slightly. Right. Apparently, all life is based on moving around electrons, right? We all consume sugar in one form or another. Sugar right. uh, has extra electrons, and basically yeah. what we do when we eat, we take those electrons and we deliver them through our bodies to oxygen, which needs extra electrons to a uh, reactor that we can breathe. But what these microscopic organisms are doing is that they're cutting out the whole sugar-eating process and just getting electrons. So they're going uh, straight for the form. electrons. Yeah. Right. So they've, these have been found where? These have been found... Um, Hang on. Are we trying to uh, talk science again and getting it all right? We are, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I think this this should be a sort of bacteria that only lives inside the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's quite interesting that there's potential to use these um, in producing uh, machines, nanobots, and possibly even computers. Apparently, Oh, okay. This is something that I don't quite understand, but they lay down pathways which um, right. act, act as wires guiding electrons into their their colonies, these bacterial colonies. 
um, they, they form these these short chains of, of wires, and that's something that we could potentially use. It's interesting, isn't it, that these days, as soon as a new form of life, a new biological discovery is made, the first thing anybody thinks of is, how can we alter this to use <laughs> to our benefit? Because we're all yeah, about we... bio-machines at the minute, aren't we? But we use bacteria all the time. Our bodies are made of so much bacteria. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and when we eat and digest sugars, it's bacteria that's doing that digesting for us, yeah. I find it interesting that over time, we just we, we pick up new sorts of bacteria and just sort of use it in the body. Mm. So, um, and I, I read a really good sci-fi story once. It was a bit sciencey, um, but it was about. Um, it kind of explains that over time, you know, like cavemen or whatever, they'd get a disease, they'd get this some bacteria, and then eventually become immune to it, and then just we just have it forever in our bodies. And you know, mm. use it in some interesting way for digestion or something. I you know, it's always, always had, there in the colon. I just had a really weird thought. Okay. Since we're using bacteria anyway to break down sugars and absorb electrons from it, yeah, we might be able to find a way at some point to use these bacteria, the electric bacteria, to actually feed on electricity ourselves. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I have so, no uh, idea how that would work, but it, it seems like a sense of... So we uh, infect ourselves make. with this sort of bacteria, then uh, go to a nearest power socket. Mm, I'm feeling, yeah. a bit, feeling a bit peckish. <laughs> and just eat some electricity from the power socket. Yeah, do it. Well, th- th- this could be something that enables us to, to use cybernetic implants. It could be a potentially really big discovery. Actually, that's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, because we need power for the implants from somewhere. Mm. If they could just power themselves yeah this this could be that that bridge between technology and biology couldn't it yeah it's also quite interesting um thinking about the search for life elsewhere in the universe this has kind of opened up a whole new avenue of, of different forms that life might take and, and different environments that they could live in could this live in space i'm i'm not sure but I'm thinking um, ele- electrical storms on other planets could potentially yeah. support this kind of life. Yeah. Right, so I think someone should add this to a uh, cr- like create a story idea from this. I think and somebody we'll, should, should uh, create we'll an alien it. profile based on this. <laughs> uh, submit a competition. Um, uh, maybe this is some kind of um, Stargate Atlantis style replicator thing. Oh, right, yeah. Biologic, like naturally occurring nanobots. So I assume if you say, say you've got a spaceship floating around in space, mm. bacteria might somehow get on the ship, start feeding from all the um, you know electrical components, mm. yeah. batteries, things like that, and uh, and waste your power. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know that's when it's a huge problem. So there's a story idea there. Yeah. Because I've just thought of another technological implication of um, self-repairing hulls and materials that could be coated with these things and and fed with electricity um, and obviously reproduced to to heal. Are you saying it's a sort of like bacterial 3D printing? Well, this is something that obviously is not a new idea, using nanobots in this way. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess this is just kind of maybe a bridge. To, to help us create nanobots, isn't it? Organic nanobots. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, thinking about that same idea with nanobots, would they be building material or would they become the material? I think you could do do either, couldn't you? Because if you've got a spaceship with a big hole in it, would the, would the nanobots just sort of position themselves in place to, they, to become... They could bond with each other, yeah, in that way, kind of form like a... Chain, chain mail, um, or, or they yeah. could yeah repair the existing metals. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, again, we're trying to talk about science. <laughs> we don't yep, know yep, much that we science, don't understand, but, uh, <laughs> especially this, this okay. brand new discovery. But uh, interesting. Okay, so we will leave this episode of the podcast there. Uh, this podcast was basically. Uh, to introduce Alien August, we will be back with another podcast 
at the end of Alien August, in which we'll be talking about all the cool ideas that uh, you guys have been submitting for the competition. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, to, to make sure you don't miss out on any of the Alien August action, um, make sure you're subscribed to the blog, uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and on YouTube as well. Okay. Anything you want to add, David? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs>